dense friends, and welcome to the Dense Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoin. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dense Media, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about Tiny Pretty Things and On Point, the two streaming dance shows that premiered over the holidays, which present almost diametrically opposed views of ballet. We'll discuss the new mental health program that Point Park University and the advocacy group Minding the Gap are developing for dance students. We'll totally stress ourselves out with a look at the impending Great Cultural Depression, but then we'll talk also about the glimmers of hope we're seeing as we head into 2021. And then we'll air our interview with the multi-talented Jared Grimes, who is in the process of choreographing the New York City Center Encore's production of The Tap Dance Kid. And that revival was first announced in September of 2020, so it's fully a pandemic show. And Jared offers great insight into what that collaborative process has been like, since it obviously is a little different than if we were doing this in non-pandemic times, and also why audiences need this particular show at this particular moment. Um, But before we dive into this week's news, I actually want to brag a little bit about just how good our upcoming interview lineup is. Um, Over the next few weeks, we're going to be airing conversations with standout choreographers and dancers and dance teachers and dance entrepreneurs and some artists who fall into more than one of those categories. And this beginning of the year time is a naturally reflective moment. And all of these smart artists shared deeply reflective thoughts about how we dance world folks can use the lessons we learned in 2020 to guide us through 2021. So what we're actually saying is we hope you'll subscribe to the podcast because we don't want you to miss out on any of these great conversations. And you can do that on your listening platform of choice or at thedanceedit.com slash podcast. And while you're at it, go ahead and leave us a rating and a review if you have a minute. So now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown, our first headline rundown of 2021. Cadence, take it away. Uh, The all-male dance company, Ten Hairy Legs, which has been on hiatus since April 1st due to the pandemic, has made the decision to legally dissolve as of December 31st. The company's eight-year history will be fully archived in the Library of Congress, and Ten Hairy Legs leadership hope that their work will inspire future generations of dancers and dance enthusiasts. On a more cheerful note, uh, a New Year's Day virtual benefit performance of Ratatouille, the TikTok musical, aka Ratatousical, brought in over $1 million in ticket sales after its January 1st debut, which will go to benefit the Actors Fund. I mean, you just, you love to see it. Russian dancer Natalia Pronina was shot dead in Moscow in what is being investigated as a contract killing. Pronina, a ballroom dancer who won several international dance competitions, was 30 years old. One of those headlines that I could not believe was real. It was so horrifying. All right, again, taking it back to more cheerful news. Dance Magazine kicked off the new year with the announcement of its 2021 25 to watch list. The annual list has a pretty stellar track record of predicting the dance stars and leaders of the future. And I have to say, as the editor in charge of pulling it all together, I am very, very glad that it's finally out in the world. But major snaps to Courtney for pulling it all together. Yes, your baby is born. Six months after her husband, beloved Broadway star Nick Cordero, died from complications connected with COVID-19, dancer Amanda Klutz has found a new path as a host on CBS's The Talk. And I just have to say I'm so excited to hear more from Klutz, who is just a gem of a human being and a ray of sunshine in almost everything she does. Uh, There's also been lots of news about dancing robots lately. Uh, From pint-sized smarticles at Northwestern University to a new video from Boston Dynamics of their Atlas spot and handle robots doing a coordinated dance routine. I want to make a joke about your 2020 bingo card, but we're in 2021. so No more bingo cards, guys. (laughs) We're just bringing stuff into existence. Yeah, done with bingo cards. Speaking of 2021, in case you missed it, we are officially in the new year, which, among other things, means that the 2020 Tony Awards did not occur in 2020. Uh, Members of the Broadway community seem to be unsure about when the awards will be held. In a recent interview with Broadway News, Tony nominee Aaron Tveit mentioned that he was still unclear on when the awards, originally slated for early December, would be held. Here's to hoping the performers will get their rightful props in the coming months, or at least in 2021. Pretty wild. I got ghosted by my favorite awards show, and it hurts. (laughs) (laughs) 
me a second. Okay. Yeah, this is another big news pendulum swing. Take a second. Um, and the dance world mourned the passing of Adolfo Shabadu Quinones, who got his start on Soul Train, but is perhaps best remembered for starring in the film Breakin. And Barbara Weisberger, a protege of George Balanchine's, who went on to found Pennsylvania Ballet. Sort of a mournful note to end our recap on. I mean, those are significant losses, even from a year in which there were a lot of significant losses in the dance world. I think Shabadu's death in particular, because it was so unexpected, hit a lot of people really hard. There were a ton of beautiful tributes to him on social media from today's commercial dance standouts. Well, and I think I saw that he had posted the day before he was found that he was finally COVID negative, and Mm -hmm. it's just heartbreaking. So in our next segment, we're going to talk about the fact that since our last roundtable recording session, not one but two big ballet shows have premiered on major streaming networks. So on December 14th, Tiny Pretty Things, a scripted drama based at a fictional ballet school, debuted on Netflix. And then four days later, On Point, a docuseries following students at the School of American Ballet, came out on Disney+. Plus. That's a lot of ballet on mainstream platforms. And the fact that both shows are reaching so many people makes it especially important to consider how they're presenting the ballet world. And the sort of TLDR summary of that is in very, very different ways. Yeah, so I was going to start by talking about Tiny Pretty Things. Um, Dance Spirit had the chance to talk with some of the creators of the show. Um, And I think hearing from them, I was really excited about the potential that the show had. The creators spoke about how they were committed to making it feel authentic to dancers. They were casting dancers who could act instead of actors who could pretend to dance. They were consulting with real dancers on little details like how the shoe room might look, how the studio was set up, how dancers might tie their point shoes. They even hired some really legit and well-known choreographers like Guillaume Cote, Tyler Peck, Robert Benet. Um, So, you know, there was a lot of high hopes for this show, but I think as dancers started to watch it, it may not have lived up to all of those hopes. I think that there was kind of some feedback that while it's great that they hired real dancers and they wanted to investigate the dance world and, you know, talk about some of the real issues within the dance world, they may not have delved into those issues with all of the authenticity that they could have. It seemed like they were relying on the classic stereotypes of dancers, you know, bloody toenails, black swan-esque rivalries, overstepping dance moms, and not doing very much to investigate those stereotypes. And I feel like I know I at least need to give a disclaimer here. I have not seen the show. Um, I've mostly just been seeing reactions on Twitter. We've read a couple of thought pieces, I think, that have been going around. So again, grain of salt. But I will say just from my initial impression from the trailer and also just looking at these reactions, I personally did not have the highest hopes that it would be the most nuanced treatment of these issues. I think... Obviously, there is a history in film of showing ballet and showing the glamour, but also wanting to show that like gritty underside, Black Swan probably being the most famous contemporaneous example of that. But I think oftentimes you're using the trappings of this world that the filmmakers are using essentially to titillate audiences, not really um, coming at it from a place of we want to understand Um, Mm -hmm. And so kind of what it sounds like to me, at least from what I've been reading and what I've been hearing, is that a lot of really good intentions about these are real issues that exist in the ballet world from racism to eating disorders to other mental health issues kind of sounds like it comes down to a question of is the writing actually nuanced enough and informed enough to be able to do that? And it sounds like the answer has been a resounding no. Yeah. So I've seen the first two episodes because that was kind of all I could stomach. Um, and I and I did go into it with some hopes because like Cadence, after doing that dance spirit story, there were people that I respected who were involved. And I thought maybe they would help moderate the whole Black Swan meets Pretty Little Liars angle that obvious, it was obvious from the beginning that Netflix was pushing pretty hard. Um, but Courtney's right. The writing just is not up to snuff. And if the writing were better, maybe I would have been a little bit more patient with it. But there was a big pacing issue. It seems like they just wanted to cram in as many of these stereotypes as possible. And so none, there was no breathing room to investigate them in a meaningful way. And also, to be totally honest, the dancing itself, which is what I was most excited to see, 
it wasn't at the level that it should have been. It didn't realistically represent what dancing at a top tier school should look like. Um, with the exception of Daniela Norman, who plays June, who is gorgeous, and I want to see dance forever and ever. That said, I have heard from some friends that they appreciated the way the show um, portrays one of its gay characters, Shane, who is allowed to be multidimensional and have a storyline that goes beyond like sidekick to the central female character, mm. which is where gay men usually end up in pop culture portrayals of ballet. And I also, of course, appreciated the casting of a black female lead. I think that Kylie Jefferson, she's not the strongest dancer on the show, but I think she is a very gifted actress. I also, for what it's worth, thought she was one of the best parts of the Hot Chocolate Nutcracker documentary, (laughs) which you should go watch. That is excellent. So I'm excited to see where her career goes. But her storyline, too, what I saw of it was very two-dimensional. And in many ways, it's actually a retread of, like, the Eva storyline from Center Stage, where it's like, sassy underdog of color gets her chance to make it big, which, since her character is right at the center of the story, I was really hoping for more, just more nuance, more subtlety, more honesty. So yeah, disappointment. Disappointment. But anyway, let's talk a little about On Point, because in many ways, that series bends over backwards not to be tiny, pretty things. Right. So On Point is the uh, docu-series following what was going to be a full school year in the lives of some School of American Ballet students. Uh, They were actually filming whenever the pandemic hit. And so instead of ending with the end of year SAB workshop, Uh, It ends up ending with, I believe it's like showing how they actually adapted to all of a sudden New York City is in lockdown, so they're not going to classes anymore. Um, This is another one I, again, have not gotten around to watching. You guys would think I would have because like we've been off for the holidays, but no. (laughs) Yeah, I have to say, full disclosure, I haven't gotten the chance to watch On Point, but I do have to say... I think that this is the kind of show that as like a little tiny Trina, I would have gone absolutely bonkers for like just getting an inside look into one of these, you know, prestigious ballet schools. It just it would have been everything I would have ever dreamt of. And just even reading about it, you know, hearing the filmmaker Larissa Bills, who created it, talk about how she was kind of inspired by the book A Very Young Dancer, which is all about Mm. being a 10 year old student Mm -hmm. in the School of American Ballet. It reminded me of my own childhood when I read A Royal Ballet School Diaries. I don't even know if anyone's ever heard of that book series. I bought it at the Scholastic Book Festival and it was everything to me. And it's just one of those things where you get a real inside look into what it's actually like for dancers without all of the trappings that Courtney was talking about before that are so often overlaid onto these stories. And it's just the kind of thing that I think young dancers especially crave so much. So I'm just, I I really, I do need to get my Disney Plus subscription back so I can watch this one. I will say, however, the week that it was coming out, um, a dear friend of mine who's also a dancer and also came up as a ballet dancer messaged me say like and we had this conversation about how looking at the trailer, there was this level of kind of discomfort that we were feeling because it seemed like maybe on some level it was going to gloss over a lot of the issues that actually are at play both broadly in ballet pedagogy Um, as well as more specifically in Balanchine-influenced institutions and even more specifically at School of American Ballet. I think it's interesting and telling that uh, the filmmakers had kind of been trying to court SAB for a while. Mm -hmm. And then it was at the end of 2018 when SAB reached out to them to refresh uh, people who don't talk about dance news for a living. That was when Peter Martins was leaving under an absolute cloud of scandal. Um, That was a few months before uh, the current leadership team came into uh, existence at New York City Ballet. And so, you know, it is on some level you have to consider this is calculated. Yeah. Retweet to all of that because that's, I have seen almost all of it. And I did thoroughly enjoy watching it, mostly because the kids that they choose to follow are wonderful. They're Mm. just great. And they were very thoughtful about choosing a group of students representing a range of races, a range of socioeconomic backgrounds, and actually showing their lives outside of the studio, which I thought was fantastic. But yeah, there's no room for critique of any part of SAB in this show, Um, which does not surprise me at all that they would say, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to 
portray the school as this beautiful, diverse ballet utopia. Um, because, as Courtney mentioned, SAB is notoriously protective of its students and New York City Ballet is notoriously protective of its image. For the school to sign off on this docuseries, there were going to be limits on what the filmmakers were allowed to show. But I wish that we could find some pop culture happy medium between tiny pretty things where all the teachers are grotesquely abusive and on point where the instructors are to a person warm and gentle and encouraging, which also doesn't feel quite real, real, especially from, I think, experiences that some of us have had at the School of American Ballet even or that our friends have had. So I wish we could get something closer to the actual lived experiences of ballet dancers that allowed for all the shades of gray that happened there. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I think part of that does come down to the fact that, you know, ballet as a rule tends to be quite insular. And even though there is this growing popular culture awareness and popularity of ballet in the mainstream, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people who are best equipped to tell those stories are the ones telling those stories, because oftentimes they're they're busy having a career. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that both Tiny Pretty Things and On Point emphasize is that dance students face incredible stresses, not just physically, but psychologically. And in our next segment, we want to talk about a new program that aims to give students the tools they need to take care of their mental health. As we've talked about many times on the podcast, the dance world is historically pretty bad at addressing dancers' mental health concerns from toxic perfectionism to eating disorders to depression to anxiety. But in a hopeful development, the advocacy group Minding the Gap has partnered with the dance department at Point Park University to create a mental health program for dance students, the first of its kind. So let's talk about what they're doing exactly. Uh, so essentially, as Margaret mentioned, uh, Point Park, kind of led by the department chair Garfield Lemonius, uh, has teamed up with um, Minding the Gaps' Kathleen McGuire Gaines, who is a frequent contributor to Dance Magazine, um, also one of like the foremost proponents of increasing mental health access for dancers and being more open about mental health issues in the dance world. So what this program currently looks like, they're one year into a proposed three-year pilot program. Um, at least for this year, all of the programming that they've done has been entirely online. And it's essentially creating roundtables for students and teachers to discuss mental health issues uh, as they apply to dance. And then uh, next semester, I believe the plan is to kind of get into more specific smaller groups and if they can get funding for it, right now they're only funded through the end of the semester. Um, they're looking at increasing to like one-on-one -on -one mental health offerings for the dancers themselves within the program. So it's a start. Dance teacher did a story about this, and I thought it was interesting. They pointed out that younger, like Gen Z students are much more open, generally speaking, than previous generations were in terms of talking about mental health. But that doesn't mean they're comfortable raising these topics with their teachers, which is a critical breakdown. And then, of course, the teachers, as the ones with the real power, need to be educated in the best practices for developing students with strong self-esteem and then making sure that mental health is destigmatized in the classroom environment, which, yeah, again, we're just at the beginning part of this process. Which I do think that pop culture destigmatization of mental health, like the fact that these students are much more willing, it seems, to discuss it, it means that those efforts to destigmatize are actually are working. working and making a difference. So yeah. our institutions need to catch up and be able to actually support an environment where the healthy dancer isn't just about their bodies, it's about their mental and emotional well-being as well. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm so excited about this program. I think like, I so believe that like mental health is so critical to dancers. I think as someone who, you know, has anxiety disorder, it just seems like something that is so obvious to me and has been for so long. But I do have to say that, you know, reading this story and seeing that this program was coming um, out of Point Park's dance department, for me, it dinged a couple of bells. You know, I'm pretty involved on dance Twitter because it's my whole job. And I was seeing some criticism coming at Point Park's dance department after a new student had tweeted a photo of their ballet syllabus. Um, and the syllabus listed that 10% of a student's grade in the class depended on quote unquote attitude and weight and even went so far as to include a passage that read students of dance are expected to maintain proportionate quote best performance weights appropriate to their body types at all times. So for me, seeing this article, I was kind of, you know, 
had some questions coming up, but I will say that Garfield Lomonius, the dance department chair who was heavily involved with the creating the Mind the Gap program, said in an article with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that once he caught wind of the requirement, he moved immediately to change it and make sure that those requirements were no longer permitted within the dance department. So I think there is, you know, there was action taken once that kind of conversation began, but I just do think, you know, it's important to still kind of recognize possibly the past of this institution as they're moving forwards. Well, and I think it's also important to note that they are nevertheless making this effort um, because let's face it, like no institution has perfect policies around any of these things. Like otherwise we wouldn't be having the conversations at the scales that we are having to have them continually. And so I think acknowledging that like, yeah, this is imperfect, but we're going to keep working towards making it better. That's, that's true of everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So In our next segment, we're going to start out pretty dark, but then take a New Year's befitting step back toward the light. So the New York Times recently published a story about a looming great cultural depression brought on by the pandemic restrictions that have hit the performing arts incredibly hard. It feels like we've just been saying that on a loop for the past 10 months, but hit them incredibly hard. The story included some terrifying statistics and then also this idea that we're at a point where artists are no longer just losing jobs, they're now losing careers. Yeah, I think what I thought was, you know, the most interesting about this article is I think we've been hearing for months, you know, that dancers aren't working right now, performing artists aren't working right now. But this article pointed out that this may have longer reaching consequences than we had originally thought. Um, that, like you said, Margaret, it's not just this temporary loss of jobs, but it may be a more permanent loss of careers for performing artists, including dancers. And as you also mentioned, there were some really scary statistics in this article. They mentioned that while the overall unemployment rate is a little below 9% for Americans, for dancers, it's 55%. And while there was supposed to be a $15 billion stimulus relief package for struggling performing arts venues that has potentially been slowed by our soon-to-be former president's response to it. Um, He was questioning why venues like the Kennedy Center were set to receive relief despite the fact that they weren't open. But moving on from that, uh, it just pointed out that in most areas, arts venues like theaters, concert halls, performance spaces were the first businesses to close, and they're likely to be among the last to reopen. Uh, Since the beginning of the virus, it seemed likely that a vaccination was the only way for performing arts venues to come back. I wish I could remember who to attribute this to, but there was a story I was editing for Dance Magazine where there was a comment made that was essentially there's a pretty decent chance that we're going to be seeing dancers change careers entirely because they need to eat, Mm -hmm. which is harrowing and remains true. Yeah. And not just freelance dancers who obviously are in huge trouble, but there was another New York Times story pointing out the difficulties that larger nonprofits are having attracting donors because they have no tickets to sell right now. So they desperately need funding. But clearly, there are many urgent causes soliciting donations. I mean, if you're an arts nonprofit, how can you respectfully acknowledge that you're not feeding the hungry or working to improve health care while still underscoring the stakes of your own situation, which is that without adequate support, you will die. It's dire. It's dire. But and do we ever need a but after all that? (laughs) So as we head into 2021, there is reason to hope. And that's how we want to conclude the roundtable portion of this episode. We want to talk about what the dance world has to look forward to this year and about what we can do to better the odds for the dance artists who are still valiantly making art. I mean, I think it's everyone is feeling this right now, but I do just want to say it because I'm so excited. I think for me, seeing that a vaccine was approved and being distributed felt like the first light at the end of the tunnel that I've seen in so long, in particular for performing arts. Because if anything has become clear in these conversations, particularly around Broadway possibly reopening, it's been made clear by the Broadway League that vaccination is really the only way that we're going to get people back into theaters. So just that was one of those tangible moments where I started to think at some point I will be able to see Hades Town again. And that for me was a huge, (laughs) huge moment of hope. 
I mean, we also, over the course of 2020, got this crash course in making and distributing digital work. We were forced to grapple with some of the big picture problems that have plagued our field for a long time. We stopped taking anything, almost literally anything, for granted. How? So the thought now is, how can we apply those lessons, lessons from the digital transformation, lessons about diversity and equity and inclusion, lessons about what dance really means to us, in this new year, as dance slowly begins to return to theaters, there is hope, as we've been saying a lot, there is hope in that this year we're going to rebuild and we're going to rebuild stronger and better. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have our interview with Jared Grimes. Stay tuned. Our guest on the podcast today is the one and only Jared Grimes. Hi, Jared. Hello. He is a renowned tap and hip hop and street jazz performer. He's a teacher. He's a choreographer, a singer, an actor. I mean, talk about a multi hyphenate talent that is many, many hyphens. His <laughs> um, long list of credits includes directing and choreographing the signature theater production of After Midnight. And he also performed and contributed choreography to the Broadway production of that show as well. And you can currently see him as the mysterious Adrian on NBC's show Manifest. So welcome, Jared. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So the reason we're talking right now is because you're choreographing the New York City Center Encore's revival of The Tap Dance Kid, directed by Kenny Leon, who you worked with on A Soldier's Play on Broadway. Congrats. That is super exciting. Thank you so much. And we're all about to learn a little bit more about the show via the Encore's Inside the Revival digital series. Its next episode, premiering January 13th, gives a behind-the-scenes look at the production's creative process. But to get started, I mean, The Tap Dance Kid, the show has a pretty incredible history. What was your connection to and your experience with it prior to the Encore's production? Oh, man, I, it was a show that I was, I was too young to actually probably experience when it was in, in its heyday. Um, but I, th I think the first recollection I had of the show was knowing that <laughs> knowing that Carlton from Fresh Prince was <laughs> that was like his big start. Alfonso Ribeiro. Yeah. So like Alfonso Ribeiro, who I just met this past year. Um, uh, that was bizarre. Um, but uh, <laughs> It, yeah, it was funny because I was just like, you know, he would he would dance every once in a while on on Fresh Prince of Bel Air, or, you know, or, or sometimes they would let him tap. And I was like, wait a minute, I was like, I was like, that's awesome. I kind of thought that was super cool that, you know, you know, at a young age, somebody that, you know, I saw on TV every week and thought was a, was a great actor, a great comedian, um, great TV personality. You know, I, I was like, oh man, he does other things. Um, and it was just, I mean, and I had grown up at that point, you know, you know, oh man, I was like, what, 10, maybe 11, nine when that show started coming on. Um, and to actually see somebody who was maybe somewhat close to my age or appeared to be close to my age, that was a triple threat. Um, that was something different than what I had actually seen in all the movies that I was watching. Because I was watching old men be triple threat, you know, the Fred Astaire, <laughs> the, the Sammy Davis Jr., the the Nicholas Brothers, the Bill Robinsons, and the, you know, the Gene Kellys and the Gregory Hines and stuff like that. They were like older men. And I was just, you know, I, he was one of, you know, Alfonso was like one of the first like kid, kid stars um, that I saw, you know, sang, tapped you know, and danced and, and was a great, was a great actor. And I was just like, oh man, cool. And everybody was like, oh, he got his start on Broadway in the show called Tap Dance Kid. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he was on Broadway, he's a Broadway star as a little kid and he's a television star um, now and a household name pretty much. And I was just like, man, that's awesome. And, um, you know, I started to look into the, to the, the show even more and, you know, learned about the likes of, you know, the Hinton battles out there. And, you know, like I said, Alfonso and, and the Dulé Hills and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh, man, like, it's cool. And, you know, meanwhile, learning about it as a little kid, I didn't really care about, you know, who was in the show. It was more about the kid. And I was like, oh, man, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to, to to be that that kid one day and make it to TV and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was kind of like my first, you know, recollection of, of Tap Dance Kid, just knowing that, like, wow, there was a show out there um that was creating you know young superstars and i would love an opportunity to actually you know get a platform like that and see if it could you know see where it could kind of take me you know and as a young kid you know i wasn't doing broadway and stuff like that but it kind of planted the seed in my mind that you know i wanted to be a performer um and that you know i didn't have to wait 
you know, to be that. I could be it right then and there, at, you know, eight, nine years old, you know. And, um, yeah, I was ready for it. Like, at that point, that was kind of like, okay, yeah, I'm ready for this. Like, it can happen any day now as opposed to, yeah, I need to wait and go to school and, you know, become a grown man before I actually have an opportunity to be, a, you know, an entertainer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was what it was for me. And how did you then get involved with this Encores production? How did you come on board? Um, you know, what's funny is like, you know, every every tap dancer, um, you know, they always have like those shows. That they say, man, I wish I could, you know, redo that. Or I wish I could remake that or remix it or, you know, bring that back from the dead and, you know, revive it and all that crazy stuff. Um, and I've never really had that bug. I've always had the bug to like kind of create my own show, um, you know, do my own thing, you know, write my own stories and stuff like that. And I would say like maybe over the last like four or five years, for some reason, I've had the itch to take like, you know, Broadway classics and just kind of put a different spin on them. And I, I don't know what that is, but I think uh, maybe just because of my maturation as a, as a choreographer, um, you know, I, I kind of have a little bit more of a, you know, a little bit more of an obsession now with the way things were done and maybe how I can, you know, put my spin on it. Mm -hmm. Um and with that comes like, you know, the tall task of classics who people think, you know, are legendary for a certain, you know, way or through a certain choreographer or through a certain lens. And, you know, I like, you know, I think, you know, my maturation is kind of, you know, kind of put a chip on my shoulder and, you know, made me competitive in terms of challenging myself and, you know, giving things a new light and a new perspective, um, especially when it comes to tap with shows that don't even have tap in them. So, um, you know, I kind of had that bug, you know, for a while and, you know, on that long laundry list of shows, um, you know, Tap Dance Kid was one of them. Now, I never thought that, like, you know, I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I knew I could make it happen if I wanted to, but, you know, I, you know, in terms of it happening in the way that I, you know, thought would line up everything in terms of, you know, everybody involved and stuff like that, I, you know, I, I, that wasn't like kind of like in my mind. Um, and lo and behold, you know what I'm saying? Here come Kenny talking about some, hey, what you think about Tap Dance Kid? I was like, you know what? God, we, you, you must have, your ears must have been itching or something like that. Cause I've been, that's been on the back of my mind for like, you know, a couple of years now. Um, and he was like, yeah, well, you know, I'm thinking about doing it. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, let me know what you need. You know what I'm saying? At that point, you know, you know, usually when people ask me to, you know, be a part of a project, you know, I have to ask a question. I'm like, well, you know, you want me to be in it or you want me to choreograph it or you want me to do both? Like, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm like one of those people, like, you know, to the grave, I'm doing everything under the sun when it comes to entertainment. And, you know, as many things I mean, as I can do when it comes to, you know, creating, I'm always up for it. So asking that question, he's like, you know, what you think about, you know, choreograph? I was like, boom, let's get it, you know? And at that point in time, it wasn't confirmed. He was just like, all right, well, I'll, you know, I'll let you know. And then, you know, um, you know, in true Kenny fashion, usually when we talk, we're talking about basketball. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I'll, he texts me and I'm thinking, um, you know, we, you know, he's talking about the game or something like that. And, you know, he was like, all right, we, you're probably going to hear from the agents in a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I, I completely forgot, you know, about Tap Dance Kid. Um, I thought he was maybe talking about something else, you know, Soldier's Play, something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, they were like, yeah, you got an offer for Tap Dance Kid. Oh, so I was like, so it's going down, down, down. So that's cool. And he's like, Lydia Diamond. And I was like, boom, yeah, I'm down. So, um, you know, it's kind of something that my brain has kind of been preparing itself for 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 a while. And it just, you know, I'm just ecstatic that, it, you know, it, it, I get the opportunity to actually do it with, you know, you know, Kenny, who I consider, I call him like my coach. I consider him to be like, you know, one of my mentors. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always studying him and, you know, studying his greatness um, and his excellence and stuff like that. And it's, it's super cool that he's brought, you know, um, you know, Lydia Diamond in, who's somebody else I, I really, you know, I'm going to look forward to learning to or learning from. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just going to be a, you know, it's going to be like college for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to, uh, to finish my four years <laughs> with flying colors when it comes to <laughs> this college. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk more about Kenny Leon, the director you're mentioning and Lydia Diamond, who's adapting the musical. How have the three of you been working together to bring this story you know, great as it is to bring it into the 21st century. And how does your choreography especially support that new vision for the show? Um, I mean, just the fact that I'm in the building um, is already like, you know, enough of the contemporary spin that I think Kenny and Lydia, you know, were possibly looking for. Um, and usually my MO is, um, you know, I, I, I'll never compromise the integrity of, of any period or any show for the sake of, you know, my own ego. Um, you know, I always look to kind of fuse, you know, the way I feel about today with the way I feel about then and the way everybody else felt about then. And, you know, the way the characters 
um, felt about then too as well. So I'm 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 a I'm a big fanatic when it comes to fusing, you know, eras, fusing styles, fusing genres, fusing mentalities, fusing social mentalities, um, political mentalities, and stuff like that, um, cultural mentalities, and all that stuff. Um, so that's why I say, like, the fact that I'm in the building, you know, I think that already kind of gives a little bit of a you know 2020 2021 edge um, to matters. Um, but then, you know, with that being said, I mean, I could be doing the Charleston. And, you know, I, you know, we know that's a classic, you know, move of, of eras long, long past. But the fact that I'm doing a Charleston automatically gives it, you know, <laughs> a contemporary edge to it, though it's still the same. So um, same thing with the Trent, same thing with the Maxi Four, Suzy Q, all that stuff. Like I can go to the club and do that stuff right now. <laughs> and nobody would know the difference. They'd be like, oh, that's cool. I'd be like, oh, this from the 30s, this from the 40s, like all that crazy stuff. Um, so, you know, um, Super, super looking forward to, to working with uh, Kenny um, and Lydia and knowing that they want to kind of put a fresh, um, a fresh take on the story um, of Tap Dance Kid. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super um, open to, you know, what the text um, provides. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of, you know, told Kenny, I was like, you know, when it comes to this project, I was just like, you know, my, my impulses, are, my instincts are pretty much probably going to be right based off of what you guys give me. Um, and then, you know, I'm super looking forward to you, you guys throwing out ideas. And, um, that's one of my favorite things about working, um, you know, in, in TV and film and in theater is like, you know, working with a director, working with a, a writer and, you know, accomplishing what I know is going on in their mind. Um, cause a lot of the times, you know, they're not dancers. Um, and it's, oh, I'm so intrigued with the way like a non-dancer, um, wants to produce, uh -huh in dance yeah. i'm so intrigued by that like that's like one of the most fascinating things for me to study is people who are not dancers or who have no rhythm um now i'm not saying that that's lydia or kenny but you know the you know i usually find inspiration in the furthest things from dance and so therefore when it comes to like a director who's not known for dancing or when it comes to a writer who's not known for dancing you know i just automatically get super excited to kind of like beat them in the middle um, and, you know, you know make their you know their wishes and their their, their ideas and their visions come to life through movement um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, that's kind of like, you know, the life I've been breathing into the, the beginning stages of the show, um, which I know, you know, <laughs> I know Kenny and, and, and Lydia are like, yeah, we, we're going to be able to do this. We're going to be able to do that because of, you know, because of Jay. So, <laughs> so I know they're, they're pretty much, they're just probably having a good time just knowing that I'm game for, for, for any vision that they bring to the table. Um, but it's definitely going to have a, woo, it's definitely going to be for a new generation. I know that for sure. Can you get for people who might be less familiar with the show? Can you give just sort of a cliff notes version of the story? And then I know it's very much in process. So which parts of that have you been able to work on so far? Which numbers have you been finessing? Yeah, you know, we've been we've been working on Fabulous Feet. So, um, you know, that's I mean, even if you don't know the show, you've probably heard of Fabulous Feet before. Um, that's like one of the most iconic, you know, songs um, in Broadway history. Um and I mean, oh my goodness, like, ah, like just getting to work on that song was like surreal because I've heard it and I've seen Hidden Battle like destroy it down so many times, just studied Hidden and just like, you know, always been enamored with his triple threat nature. Um, like I said, those are the guys that I came up on, you know, him, Greg Birch, you know, all those guys. Um, yeah, you know, Andre the Shields, like, oh my gosh, like those guys, you know, in their heyday and still now to this day, were, you know, people that I, you know, I look up to. Um, and I mean, so like Fabulous Feet was just like, you know, it was kind of like, all right, well, I already know it. <laughs> like, all right, I already know what was done. I know the song, um, you know, so it's just like, you know, going into it, it's just, you know, you know, getting into the, the creative space with Dulé and um, and figuring out just where we want to take it based on his abilities and based on, you know, you know, how he always wanted to do the number. Um, and then we push and then we reach some, you know, you know, outside of that. And so, um, you know, I mean, like, the, it's the story, Tap Dance Kid is the story of, of a kid trying to find, you know, his way in entertainment, you know, and, um, you know, family is not always the answer. Sometimes you have to challenge your family to, you know, to expand on their mind and their mentality in order to, you know, achieve your own greatness. And, um, you know, that's what Tap Dance Kid is and Fabulous Feet is pretty much, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a culmination of, you know, what the show embodies. It's like, you know, when you have something that is an asset, when you have something that is a blessing, when you have something that is a, is a, is a gift, um, there's no way humanly possible you can, um, you know, you can stifle <laughs> that energy. You can stifle the possibility of connection with people. Like that's just, there's no way, you just have to let it out. Sometimes you have to look down and say, yo, I 
I have fabulous feet and I can't change that. So I'm going to use it to the best of my ability. I'm going to try to, you know, create change and, you know, you know, inspire somebody else to have fabulous hands for playing the piano or have a fabulous voice or to have fabulous vision or, you know, to have fabulous lines. And so, you know, I like to think that, you know, the version of this show or this iteration of the show is really going to um, allow people to find their own shine um, and never, you know, deny themselves uh, of, of that, you know, um, of that liberty. Um, even if family is against you, or if you have a boss that's against you, or if religion is against you, or culture is against you, or customs are against you, or, you know, the economy is against you, you know, I, I think that, you know, we aim to show the world that, you know, like I said, whatever it is that is your calling, um, whatever it is that you feel like is your, you know, your, your passion and is your outlet and your release and your ultimate connection with the world. Um, and your connection with, you know, creating, you know, tomorrow for yourself, like, sing about it, mm -hmm. dance about it, write about it, um, love it, um, you know, compete with it, stretch it, challenge it, um, but, you know, never deny it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that is the story of Tap Dance Kid is just, you know, spreading your wings <laughs> and recognizing those fabulous feet. Let's talk for a minute. You, you're mentioning Dulé Hill, who's your Uncle Dipsy. And you, hey. have, you, you, have this, you have this great relationship with him. And I mean, he was, of course, a lot of people already know he was in the Tap Dance Kid as a kid, as you mentioned. He was playing Willie. And then now working with him on this new production and having this history with him, too. How do the two of you sort of vibe creatively? Like, how do you feed off each other's creative energy? <laughs> it was fun. it's a party like <laughs> um i mean i first saw Dulé performing on broadway a long time ago in um in, in, in norris funk and um i didn't even know who he was um uh my fa my favorite tap dancer um you know like of all like current tap dancer of all time and he was also in that show as well uh is bakari wilder um and uh i mean he's still somebody i look up to greatly so i was like hyped to go see him in that show and um and 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 everybody else in the show too because I mean as a young kid you know twelve thirteen I mean that show was like you know that was like heaven for me and I was like I was listening to the soundtrack and I was listening to all the Bakari's um all his solos and stuff like that and I was like oh man mom I was like I can't wait to see him and I, I went to New York and I took class with him too and then when I went to see the show I was like man who's the other dude like what is that? I was like this other dude is all you know I was like I knew I knew there was I noticed there was something different about him I was like you know he was bringing like an acting edge um to to his character and everything like that and i was just like it always kind of stuck with me because like i said i was a musical theater kid and i was singing and dancing and acting um so my eye always gravitated towards you know somebody i felt you know was, was similar to me and that kind of planted the seed i was like do a hill do a hill do a hill and i was like man that, that dude is i was like i need to put him on my radar and then i saw that he was in the movie she's all that and then i saw that you know he moved out to la and that he was he's on the west wing and i was like I was like, he's the blueprint. I was like, that's the blueprint for me. Like that's, you know, cause Greg, Greg was gone. Um, you know, and you know, when I was in college, you know, Gregory passed away. I think my freshman, fresh before my freshman going in sophomore year, um, you know, you know, Sammy was no longer here. Um, you know, a lot of the greats were kind of passing on. Um, the ones that I felt like were the blueprint for me. Um, and I was like, you know, who's the young guy kind of doing that? And I was like, this dude, like, I mean, it's him. Like this dude is destroying Hollywood. You know, he's still actively singing and tap dancing. And, you know, I was like, he's a tap dancer. And I was like, you know, he's literally the, the descendant of like, you know, the Gregory blueprint, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the Sammy blueprint. And so I just started to study him. I just, I literally started to study him. I was watching all his, you know, the projects that he was a part of. Um, I was like, you know, I was learning about who his agents were, like who everything, like that's me. I'm just like a sponge. I would study, you know, the goal in mind down, you know, in whatever it takes. And, um, and I'll study it and I'll try to, figure out how to do that in my own way. Um, and then I got to meet him when I was, a, I was doing a show called um, Imagine Tap um, in Chicago, a uh, choreographer, Derek Grant, uh, another mentor of mine. And, um, you know, Dulé came to see the show and he came backstage and I was like, yo, I, I didn't fan out, but I was like, yo, like, man, you're the blueprint. Like, yo, I've been like studying you for so long. You know, and at that time, you know, uh, you know, I was doing like maybe small parts in TV here and there, but I wasn't like, you know, a, a, you know, a recurring role on any show. You know, I hadn't really gotten my foot in the door um, yet. But he was one of the reasons why, you know, I first, you know, realized that it was possible. Like that kind of performer is possible. The guy whose first love is tap dance can also, you know, act and sing and write and choreograph and direct and produce. Um, you know, so when meet, meeting him, you know, I think it was 2009, I can't remember, 2009, 2008, something like that. Meeting him was just like, bang. And then he was like, yo, take my number. And I was like, what? Like, 
So like I, I, I got his number. We just kept up over the years. Um, you know, if I was doing a show, he would hit me up and, you know, you know, see, say he was in town, he was coming to the show or if, um, you know, if he knew I was in LA or something like that for a particular reason, you know, he would hit me up or I would hit him up and we would try to get up or, you know, I would ask him questions. Like he was always an open book, um, um, for me. So, you know, he kind of became like a big brother figure and, um, that all that time passed. And I think 2009, like maybe like six years might've passed. And then the first time we actually got to work together was on uh, after midnight on Broadway. And it was, it was funny too, because people were asking me about different roles and stuff like that. Went Marsalis was asking me a lot of people, you know, different roles. I was like, yeah, you gotta get do late. I like, you gotta get like, you know, do late for this project. I was like, I don't know what, you know, he would do in this project. I was like, he can do anything. So, um, you know, project like this would be great to have do late, but they were already, they were already thinking about him anyway. Um, so it was so cool. And I was like, man, we finally got in the same room and it was just cool to see how he worked. Um, and he actually wasn't tap dancing in the show and I was, so it was like, I was like, man, that's kind of, that's crazy. And that was still kind of great for me to see him be so great without actually putting on a pair of top shoes. Um, so I was like, yet again, I'm constantly learning from, you know, the, the constant professional that he was. Um, and so we did, you know, tap, uh, we did after midnight for, I think we got like eight months out of that. You know, we did the Tonys and everything like that. And I'm just, you know, just soaking it up, talking to him. He's, you know, he's, he's talking to me. We're having great conversations. I'm watching him on stage every night. He's watching me on stage every night. Um, and then after that, you know, um, couple you know, a couple years go by you know you know like i said we, we still big bro bro little bro bro um and um you know we work again on i think he recommended me for um lights out Nat king cole which he's starring in mm-hmm. and alongside co-star um daniel watts who's somebody i kind of grew up with as well too and um, they were like yeah we got this this big tap number in the show um we want you to come out and do it um and i was in south korea filming a movie at that time um, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I got to figure out if I can get out of my contract, um, to come there to, uh, to spend like three days to just put that production number together and, and do it. And so I ended up being, I ended up being able to, and I like flew from South Korea into Pennsylvania <laughs> and I choreographed the number and then flew back to South Korea to go back to set, uh, to film, uh, Swing Kids, Swing Kids uh, yeah. South Korean version. Um, and, um, that was awesome. That was great. And then they did it again at the Geffen. And I got to elaborate and expand on a couple of different numbers. Yeah, we just had a, a good time with that project again. And it was yet a, uh, yet again, another project with a different uh, creative team that we had a great experience with. And then here we go again with Tap Dance Kid. And I mean, this like, it's just like the universe, like literally like drop Dulé, you know what I'm saying? In the palm of my hand, it was like, yo, this guy is going to be somebody that's going to be, you know, just a, a great, a great, um, a symbol of hope when it comes to what you, you know, you strive for um, as an artist. And, um, you know, though we're completely different, um, you know, we're similar in so many different ways. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so weird. Like he was like the blueprint and now he's like big bro. So, <laughs> so it's like, it's so crazy even think that like, you know, there was a time when he was just like the guy on the television screen or on stage that I was always trying to, you know, you know, figure out how to, you know, you know, pattern myself after, you know, to having his phone number, to choreographing numbers that, to being on stage with him, to choreographing numbers that, you know, he's, he's a part of. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm always in good company with him and I'm always learning a lot from him. And it's just, it's, it's so much positive energy and so many laughs um, and so much inspiration um, that the movement is almost second to just, you know, our, our bond. Um, and like choreography happens, it happens super fast. I like guess like, We'll just be in a room. We'll be like, bolt, it's done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, bolt, this, that. Like, what you think about this? Maybe that? All right, we turn here. You want to double? Do a double turn? Oh, you want to turn to the right? Bolt, let's switch that. Okay, cool. Um, triplet. Now nah, maybe take that back. All right, put an add a pull back on that. Like, we just, like, we, it's, it's, it flies. And then he just kills. Like, he, he destroys. Like, he kills. Um, so I can always throw anything at him. And, um, you know, we, we laugh through the craziness and we, we, you know, we, uh, we seek the, 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 we seek the, the the stuff beyond what people you know expect when it comes to musicality, when it comes to music, when it comes to style, and we're always trying to channel you know some of the the idols that we you know we both um, you know looked up to as well too. So um, I mean he's you know he's a no brainer for me every time when it comes to like any project. I don't even care if it has tap in it or if if, if he's just there, it's a no brainer. I'm like yeah, do like whatever, do like yeah, boom. Like we riding horses, do like boom. Oh, painting pictures, yo, call do like. <laughs> like skate skateboarding yeah call 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 do let's 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 get him on this like you know what I'm, <laughs> so, i'm with it 
Um, so I want to talk about too, you know, obviously you're trying to create this number during a pandemic, which poses some challenges. What what yeah. has that whole process been like? And have you also found that it sort of sparked your creativity in any unexpected ways? Um, it's the same. I'm not gonna lie, the only thing that's different is the laptop. That's like <laughs> that's the I mean, for me, the energy is still the same, the fun is still the same. My process is still the same. I'm just not there, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I'm still just as effective um, and probably effective even more in, in certain ways just because of, you know, the accent that the computer uh, provides. So, um, I mean, it, it really, I mean, it, you know, can't stop, won't stop. I mean, it's the same thing for me. Um, it hasn't really dampened, you know, my creative process or anybody that I've, I've worked with. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's always more fun to be in the room with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I mean, you know, I don't have to get on a plane and fly out to do lay to, you know, choreographs. I'm not going to just hit a button and I could be in his garage <laughs> or he could be in my garage. You know, we can get things done. So, you know, it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages. But, um, you know, overall, I feel like, you know, I'm still good to go. Making it work. Um, this is a big question and you've, you've touched on it a little bit already. But how would you say that the Tap Dance Kid, this production of it, speaks to the issues and the challenges that are facing the performing arts world and, and really just the world as a whole today? Like, why is it important for audiences to see this show at this moment? Um, well, you know, there's, there's a stereotype out there, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, the African-American male um, being limited to certain things that, you know, culturally are glorified, you know, in mainstream media, rap, sports, you know, singing, dancing. Um, and somehow that's, you know, you know how the mainstream media can do, they can saturate and desaturate things so much that it kind of strips, um, you know, things with so much culture integrity, it strips it away from it and just makes it dancing or just makes it, you know, black <laughs> or just makes it Broadway or just makes it a time step or just makes it tap sheet. And it's, it's, it's so much more, um, you know, the, the legacy of what tap dance means to the African-American culture, the legacy of what, you know, jazz music means to, you know, African-American culture and what jazz music spawned in terms of bebop and, you know, contemporary music, jazz, you know, everything comes from jazz. Um, and, you know, tap dance kid to me is a celebration of, you know, those two having always worked in harmony since the beginning of time, since slavery. <laughs> you know what I mean? They they were two cultural, um, you know, cultural bright spots, you know, for African American people that not only, you know, uh, you know, gave us a voice, um, but, you know, it, it, it allowed people, you know, to see you know, the beauty of what it was to be black and to celebrate, you know, you know, black culture um, and, you know, tap dance and singing and dancing, you know, those are, just, that's just a few of the ways, you know, I mean, those aren't the only ways, but I think it's, it's great for us to celebrate shows like Tap Dance Kid because it, it shows the, the, the passing of the torch, um, you know, the, the continuation of, you know, not just tap dance or tap shoes, but the continuation, you know, of a cultural legacy that, you know, like I said, that connects with people who tapped because they had their instruments taken away <laughs> or that was the only way that they could, you know, communicate or, you know, that was the only, you know, you know, thing that they had of, you know, personal recess or fun, you know, to do after working, you know, tirelessly, you know, to or for a world that, you know, you know, pretty much just reduce them to just work um and so you know like i said tap dance kid is a long way from that type of um grip negative grip you know what i mean it's, it's definitely a huge departure from that um but you know it definitely like you know <laughs> that's how far we've come like we've come this far to be able to do the tap dance kids of the world to be able to do the jelly's last jams of the world to be able to do the you know the after midnights of the world um and so um oh, the sophisticated the ladies of the world, the UV of the world. Um, you know, it's 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 tap dance kid is one of those things that is continuing the 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 tradition of not letting people forget that you know a lot of this world was built on jazz music. A lot of this world was built on what jazz music made people do, which was sing, which was dance, which was come together 
which was tap, which was Lindy Hop, which was create and write poetry, was to create Broadway, which was to create, you know, uh, which was to defy segregation, which was to break down racial barriers, which were, you know what I mean, which was to um, affect politics, um, like, you know, which to affect and put an uh, uh, imprint on class structure and, and, and race and sex and you know, I mean, just, I mean, and like I said, everything comes from jazz and like, boom, tap comes from jazz as well, too. The way tap kind of, you know, paralleled in harmony with, you know, jazz in this world, too. And then, boom, tap dance kid, you know what I'm saying? And it's just like, you know, it's very important for us to, you know, have a window to the past, you know, in the form of tap dance kid and, you know, Uncle Dipsy and and the willies of the world. Like, we we have to have that. Or without that, you know, we only have the Little Waynes. <laughs> without that, we only have the Kanye West. And, you know, we, you know, I'm not knocking them, but we have to understand where that comes from. Because if we just understand that, then we've just neglected, <laughs> we've neglected uh, such a beautiful and rich history of a people um, that really, you know, sparked the foundation um, of the things that make so many different races and so many people happy today. Thank you so much, Jared. I, please, everyone, be sure to tune in to the Encores Inside the Revival episode on the Tap Dance Kid that's premiering January 13th. You can find that on the New York City Center YouTube channel, which we'll link to in the episode description. We'll do all that. And then, Jared, what else do you have on the horizon that you'd like to call out? Are you filming right now for Manifest? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh Stay gosh. tuned for season season three. I'm not filming at the moment. I'm I'm away for um for for the holidays. But yeah, we are still filming. Season three is going to be crazy. Oh my goodness. Um, and of course, after midnight, um, it's my directorial debut. Um, some directing and choreographing after midnight, which I was a part of on Broadway. Um, and got some got some got some 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 screenplays in the oven that we're working on right now. Um, uh, one in particular with Quentin Marsalis. Um, so yeah, be on the lookout for that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, just out there really trying to push the envelope and, you know, using this time that we all have to continue to create so that way when things get better, you know, there's some new kids on the block <laughs> when it comes to, you know, television, film and, and theater as well. Oh, and I should mention to, to keep up with everything that Jared has going on, make sure you're stalking him properly on social media. Uh, <laughs> I got some crazy stuff. <laughs> you got some fun stuff. You're, so you're at Grimey, G-R-I-M-E-Y-S-T-E-P-Z on Instagram. Yeah. And also on TikTok. Yes, on TikTok, too. You have hey! a pretty, pretty good TikTok thing going. It's pretty fun. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be, you know, a viral social media uh, person, but I, I do love sharing and I do love, um, you know, making people happy and, you know, seeing people smile and just, you know, entertaining and, you know, whatever way I can do that, you know. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm always seeking that opportunity. So can't be on stage. Boom. I can just post a little video that makes you, you know, that, that makes you inspired or, you know, gives you joy in some way, shape, or form. When I'm on stage, boom, I can still make that video. <laughs> so I'll just be doing it while I'm on stage at the same time. So the, the performing and the entertainment never stops. And uh, it should never stop for anybody. Thanks again to Jared. I actually was able to preview his encores inside the revival episode, and you get some really fantastic behind the scenes glimpses of Jared working remotely with Dula Hill on Fabulous Feet. Like you can just feel the creative electricity between these two, even as they're working long distance, like tapping in their respective garages. Um, so be sure to check out that episode when it premieres next Wednesday. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone, and Happy New Year. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Meenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Hi, everybody. This is Jack. And this is Reed. From Dance and Stuff Podcast. Please tune in to listen to our podcast. 
where we talk about movies, toothpaste, nice memories. Yes, nice and mundane and occasionally dance. Occasionally we talk to people inside of dance. And, and occasionally we talk to people out, outside of dance and like film, TV, theater, absolutely. what have you. Uh, and maybe a, 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 a psychic, who knows? Yeah, basically you're going to want to have to listen to us talk. So if you like the tones of our yeah. voice, tune on in every Friday, anywhere you can find podcasts. We loves you. Bye.